Thank you for joining us today. Um, just by way of a very brief introduction, we're here today to, to hear uh, from B Dr. Bethany Wigan, who's an associate professor and graduate chair of German and affiliate faculty in English and Comparative Literature at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, in 2014, she established the Penn Program in Environmental Humanities, a collective of students, faculty, staff, artists, and writers at Penn and in the Philadelphia region who collaborate via interdisciplinary research, teaching, and imaginative public engagement. And that's what she's here to talk to us about in her talk entitled Environmental Humanists and Climate Humanists, Partnerships and Program Building in American College Campuses. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Bethany Wick. Thanks so much for being here, and thanks especially um, to Dustin and the colleagues for um, inviting me and for having such a great lunch together. Um, you can hear already in the title that Dustin gave you, I had sent a title that said the same part before the colon, but after the colon, it was uh, partnerships and program building in American colleges, as Dustin just read to you, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to talk about Penn in my prepared parks, in my prepared remarks, and I really want to hear about what you're doing here and what you know about also maybe in other universities and colleges across the country. Um, it's really exciting what I've learned about that you're doing here, and I expect to learn as much from you as you will from me. So I have about a 30-minute talk. Um, that I, I wrote for you. I actually usually don't write talks uh, anymore. One of the things about doing transdisciplinary work is that you learn that your own disciplinary habits, in my case as a comparative literature scholar, um, that those habits of carefully writing a narrative and reading it aloud, which is the way that um, literature professors tend to give remarks, um, that that in fact does not play very well to scientists and actually to anybody who doesn't want to like fall asleep. Um, so I'm going to try to toggle back and forth between these prepared remarks, some off the cuff um, sort of thinking with pictures with you, and if you're getting really bored and you just can't take it, then shoot your hand up and we'll just go straight into the Q&A. Um, but I am really looking forward to the Q&A, um, and I encourage you to stick around um, for that. I was told that we could drink collectively like 20 gallons of coffee um, <laughs> afterward, so uh, stay tuned for that. Here you see two students who took a class with me last semester. The class, I'm going to come back to it in a little bit, it was called Liquid Histories and Floating Archives. One of the themes I'm going to hit on in this lecture is the importance of trans-institutional collaboration. And what I like about this picture is that you see a Penn student and you also see a student from Bryn Mawr. Um, and I thought that was an important way to stake out the ways that we're really trying to make this a Penn plus and a very trying to make this public. What they're looking at here is Philadelphia's Schuylkill River, the tidal section. It's a watery place, home at once to native and invasive plants, fish, and fowl. It's a riverside trail beloved by dogs and their humans, as well as bicyclists who may or may not be purely human. Freight rail lines, the Schuylkill Expressway or the Schuylkill Distressway, and myriad other assemblages. In other words, it's a mixed up place. And to apprehend its nature cultures requires a welter of research methods and, as you'll hear, some tolerance for improvisation. Working with this river invites a curiosity about and maybe a sympathy with the old, the discarded, and even the forgotten. Today, and especially on rainy days in our climate-changed Philadelphia, rain arrives more suddenly and more severely the rain can also elicit a distinct sense of foreboding, that it's not just an, about the river, that our river is not just bearing witness to our carbon intensive past, but that it portends a future of spreading ruins. The environment is no longer there where we are not, if ever that was, for we humans are everywhere and our footprints are too. The human species has become, in the memorable words of Deepesh Chakrabarti, a geohistorical agent. 
But of course, we humans are not everywhere one and the same. Environmental degradation is a tragedy of the commons to be sure, but it is not a tragedy whose burdens are shared equally. Its plot is driven by environmental racism and other social and interspecies injustices, not least of which is a lack of access to affordable, high quality education, Rowan of course being the great exception I've learned. Um, it's also a tragedy fueled by a shrinking of the knowledge commons and the privatization of the knowledge economy. So today, as the sacrificial landscapes of the extractive economy continue to proliferate and carbon emissions still climb, I'd like to propose that we not look away, but that in the words of science studies scholar Donna Haraway, we stay with the trouble. Present disciplinary configurations make it hard to represent and so to understand the mix up, mixed up world. Yet amidst our disciplinary fatigue, transdisciplinary configurations are popping up, including, I would say, the environmental humanities as an important driver of those experiments. One, of course, is the program uh, in environmental humanities that I direct at Penn, bringing faculty across the arts and sciences, that's one school at Penn, as well as across schools, the School of Design, School of Engineering, and the School of both Medicine and Communications together. Um, to do environmental research together. And today, in these prepared remarks, I want to draw on three interrelated examples of collaborative research projects. It's really only two, to be honest, um, in which I have been centrally involved. Each aims to, to uh, research and teach amidst distinctly anthropogenic scapes, land and waterscapes. And I think um, they demonstrate the vital need for more inclusive public scholarship. Experiential and embodied learning, learning are integral to all of them, and I think to STEAM education more broadly. The three projects are, just to give you the names, the Schuylkill River Research Corps, a, ri a related project on rising waters, and a project called Data Refuge. Each aims to cultivate the right to research as a human right, and each has offered me and continues to provide hopeful glimpses into the power and potential of public scholarship. And I hope that they will do so for you as well. Each of the projects bears important connections to the Schuylkill and we will begin there. So for centuries, the title Schuylkill, the title Schuylkill and the Delaware have provided a laboratory for human experiments, ranging from land reclamation to energy transitions. This is a riverscape at once singular and uniquely local and a place, one of many, created through the centuries long history of plants, animals, mineral, capital, knowledge, ideology, and the crossings of free and enslaved humans crossing oceans. Last semester, with our basin's marshy past and increasingly soggy future in mind, my students in that class I mentioned aimed to unpack catalog and describe these ongoing geo and hydroengineering attempts. We understood ourselves to be participant observers in this often unwitting lab, and we aimed to develop research methods that recognized the riverscape itself as agential, as participating in our actions and in others. As I mentioned, it was called Liquid Histories and Floating Archives, and the class was shared across six departments at, at Penn, across the natural and social sciences, as well as the humanities. Adding to its unusual nature was a weekly assignment that prompted students to develop embodied research practices, in our case, walking meditations on our analytic materials. Um, and the students wrote a fantastic blog uh, on these meditations that I'd be um, thrilled to share with you at some point. Um, and much of the thinking in this paper actually really emerged in dialogue with these students and I'd really like to thank them um, for that. Uh, and I'd also like to thank another student, Patricia Kim, whose work uh, is also embedded in the latter part of this uh, talk. She's a co-organizer of the Data Refuge Project. Now, the Schuylkill ends in the tidal waters of the Delaware River. 
twice daily, these rivers rise between six and eight feet in a normal tide, and then ebb as they head toward the Delaware Bay and Atlantic Ocean. The salt line moves too, upriver when it's dry and down when it's wet, well below the water intakes which provide Philadelphia's municipal water. The river, the Schuylkill, begins in the Piedmont region of the Mid-Atlantic in Schuylkill County, where rich seams of hard coal or anthracite coal have been mined since the late 18th century. It flows roughly 160 miles southeast before it joins the Delaware at Philadelphia's southern tip. Much of the city's southern wards are on land reclaimed by European settler colonists from the region's enormously productive marshes beginning in the 17th century and with increasing speed and volume into the 19th. In 1999, an official act of Congress declared the Schuylkill River a historic river and it allocated funds for recreational trails and official interpretive materials. The act lauds efforts made to restore the industrial river, removing coal matter and remediating the legacies of agricultural and industrial effluents long dumped into it. Curiously, the act omits the history of oil on the river, detected on the water table in city wards for well over a hundred years. The river borders the city's western edge and then cuts through the large urban park created at the end of the 19th century to, to protect its drinking waters. Past the fall line, which is today at roughly the art museum in Philadelphia where that dam is, um, past the fall line the river becomes tidal and there, as you've heard, it's crossed by rail lines and highways. The Schuylkill is the major tributary of the Delaware, um, and their confluence is home to one of the oldest, if not the oldest, operating oil refinery in the world. One might say this is the cradle of our own petro-modernity built on land taken from the water. As the sea rises, it's remaking these historic relations of land and water on which our city, like Camden and many others across the planet, is built. By no later than 2100, and perhaps far sooner, the sea will be back. Nuisance flooding is a problem in many places, uh, increasingly so, and it's becoming more of the norm rather than the exception. Now the final projects that the students made in that experimental liquid histories class consisted of digitized or born digital objects found or created and interpreted for inclusion in a digital river archive. It's built on an open source Omeka platform and this repository is meant to be a living archive. That is a stewarded collection documenting environmental research on the river's past and present as well as a source for speculative, collaborative visions of possible futures. The archive is made and tended by the Schuylkill Research Corps, an informal collective of academics, community partners, artists, and diverse individuals who, since 2016, have been crossing disciplinary borders as well as institutional fences, aiming to connect town and gown and include a diverse array of public participants. As we say in our mission statement, we aim to document the past, explore the present, and envision the possible futures of Philadelphia's urban waters. This transdisciplinary work is trans in a number of ways, consciously developed to queer or make strange the typical discipline, our typical disciplinary methods and cultures. Central is a question that writer Amitav Ghosh asks in his beautiful essays, The Great Derangement. Quote, how did the provinces of the imagination and the science come to be so sharply divided? The Schuylkill Corps works across ways of knowing and various kinds of embodied knowledge to ask also what might we do to bridge them? So we also work trans historically. We aim, as I have said, to stay with the trouble, staying with the bridging work, the trans, as it were, without rushing across the tense span and onto quick techno-driven solutions. A great deal of our work is thus speculative, future-oriented, and imaginative. We're trying to slow down, even in 
or especially in this moment of uh, ecological crisis, so as to attune ourselves to the long histories and slow violence of its making. In this regard, we're not only transdisciplinary, but we aim to think the urgency of now together with the long durational histories of its making and the bygone futures that might have been. Our work thus collectively responds to the urgencies of the Anthropocene in the spirit of what Isabel Stenger has called slow science, mindful of our times feeling ever out of joint and our contemporary places always uncanny, haunted by what was, what could have been, and what might be. Transgeographically. So while we work on this tightly circumscribed geography, 12 miles of a tidal river, this short stretch really, we aim to attend to the ways that this one location has been made and remade by global flows of capital and other currencies of power, both soft and hard. And before we move on, I just wanted to show you some snapshots of a few projects that various research core members have been working on as we really are endeavoring to co-create a public curriculum of educational materials and creative arts and sciences experiments designed for continued river engagement. Um, and they, they have a real range, uh, ranging from collecting independent emissions data from the refinery whose historic images you saw earlier to developing on-water refinery tours, um, which are taken by a kayak and are always now sold out. Um, they're free, but sold out, you know, like we ran out of kayaks, <laughs> uh, to building prototypes of bioremediating wetlands and habitat pods. So we began our work together um, really with a research seminar. Um, and as you can see here, it was uh, co-organized by Bartram's Garden, uh, Drexel, and Professor Peter DiCarlo there, and, and the Penn Program in Environmental Humanities. Um, and we featured bi-monthly, so twice monthly presentations by scientists and engineers, artists and architects, water department officials, fish and wildlife service professionals, environmental justice advocates, anti-fracking advocates, uh, atmospheric chemists, art historians. Um, it's been a real incub incubator aiming to form a community of practice that can transcend silos. Here you see civil engineer uh, at Drexel, um, Charles Hawes, who presented to us on, on his work uh, in the same week, very intentionally, that New York-based artist Eve Mosher presented. And we've really been trying to foster these distant disciplinary dialogues and to see when we think from these various angles um, how we see and understand this place in a more complex kind of way. We created um, a mobile installation about the different types of data, dates and others, datum is the Latin singular for the plural word data, um, the different types of data that one would need to be able to understand a river. Um, this was created by Patricia Kim, who I mentioned before, um, and we were really thrilled when um, our local PBS affiliate, WHYY, picked it up, and um, we, of course, got a lot more viewers, uh, thanks to WHYY. Um, we also, in partnership with the Eastwick Friends and Neighbors Coalition, um, Eastwick Neighbors have been contributing oral histories. Um, and and uh, we, we, of course, made the oral histories. There's privacy settings. Some are switched to public. Some are switched to private so that contributors can control that access. The public ones uh, are for anybody can listen to. Um, but it wasn't enough for us. We didn't think it would be sufficient to just create a digital repository. We wanted to be able to make that our kind more tangible and bring it into uh, closer to people's uh, neighborhoods. In Eastwick, um, is, Eastwick is the home, among, amid, among other things, of the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge. And um, the, the refuge manager, Lamar Gore, has just been incredibly helpful. We built this 
jukebox, the Eastwick Oral History jukebox, so you can pull a binder off a shelf, you open it up, and the transponder on the back of the binder then turns on the audio file, and you hear the sound of, in this case, you see um, Earl Wilson and surrounding interpretive materials. People talk about their life with water in Eastwick in these oral histories. Eastwick is the lowest lying neighborhood in Philadelphia. Um, some parts of it are, in fact, below sea level. Um, and is really uh, ground zero uh, for sea level rise. Um, we've had students who then take the oral histories and have created uh, map projects to exhibit them in much more robust ways. Um, that was a project created by student Anna Alonzo. Here you see the oil refinery tour. As you click on these points on the map, um, you bring up um, images. This one was created by Corinne Walk, um, and as uh, you can go and take it in person if you would like. Um, in addition to doing it uh, online, uh, it, the tour leaves out of Bartram's Garden Community Boathouse um, and regularly scheduled. Um, we've hosted workshops for students in partnership with authors. There's a public housing project around uh, Bartram's Garden. Students there often don't, uh, young students, uh, often don't know how to swim and are quite afraid of the river for a variety of reasons. Um, and these artists invited the youngest um, visitors to the garden to think about how the river might be a source of beasts, but also possible future besties. And they made this book uh, about that. Um, these projects have been funded through a modest grant making program that we administer in the program um, called the Ecotopian Toolmakers Program, where we make competitive awards of $1,500 available on an annual um, basis. At lunch, um, I was, oh, sorry, here's one example of um, an artist, um, the first attempt at the um, the Embodied Scientist Parkour. Um, this parkour uh, featured seven stations along the tidal river. Each one had a set of you know, exercises you were supposed to do. Here's number three, climbing out of sea level rise. Um, and and it, it, they um, are coming back, in fact, to do the parkour again. Um, and it, I cannot tell you enough how awesome it is. You should come. It's public. It will be Saturday morning, May 11th. Keep your fingers crossed it won't be uh, too wet. <laughs> um, they're a ter terrific group of artists who themselves work transdisciplinarily. One is an engineer, another is a dancer, um, and a historian of science, and um, a, a botanical um, expert. And they are really a very innovative group. Now, I mentioned uh, the second project that I wanted to talk to you about, and this is, of course, very much, it might not appear related to Philadelphia, but it is, in fact, through this research project. The research project is called Rising Waters Philadelphia and Mumbai, um, and I'm just going to say very briefly um, a word about this project now a little more formally. So from Philadelphia to Camden to Mumbai, Modern cities have been made through centuries-long efforts to tame these unruly relations between land and water. In diverse port cities, farmers and merchants and then engineers drained wetlands and built river embankments and seawalls to keep waters at bay. These projects have made urban life as we know it possible, but they have also produced raced and class geographies of inequality in the city. Today, climate change promises to exacerbate social inequalities and further squeeze non-human natures. As you no doubt know, in October 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its special report on what 1.5 degrees of warming will mean. It was widely described as a report in which you could hear scientists screaming, these were press reports, scientists screaming between the lines. 1.5 degrees of warming set as an acceptable upper limit by the Paris Climate Accords means many coastal zones in our cities will be underwater. Um, and of course, uh, it seems increasingly unlikely that we will meet this. Now, nearly 40% of the planet's population, some 2.4 billion people, live within 100 kilometers from the ocean. 600 million people, or 10% of global population, live in coastal areas less than 10 meters above sea level. 
With 1.5 degrees of warming, as you might have heard, some Pacific Island nations, uh, such as the small island developing states, will disappear entirely. Closer to Philadelphia, 1.5 meters of sea level rise will inundate approximately a third of Delaware, all of the Philadelphia International Airport, and most of Eastwick. The IPCC special report urges that, quote, education, information, and community approaches, including those that are informed by indigenous knowledge and local knowledge, can accelerate the wide-scale behavior changes consistent with adapting to and limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. Now, broadly speaking, our Rising Waters projects aim to foster dialogue between the Schuylkill Research Corps and other public-facing research collectives, teaching and learning with and on inhabited waters. And we, we want to co-cultivate these public research, um, this public research and learning. We were talking about lunch, about what can we do together here uh, in the Delaware Bay. Um, plans are afoot, rest assured. Um, last summer, together with Drexel colleagues, we hosted an on-water intensive research seminar for two full weeks. And in January, we, uh, we just completed the winter intensive co-hosted by the Tata Institute of Social Sciences and the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai. In May, in Philadelphia, um, we'll host a three-day gathering of environmental humanists, scientists, and artists. You are warmly welcomed. Uh, each invited guest uh, is representing, or speaking guest, I should say, represents research collectives working on local waters from the Susquehanna and the Chesapeake Bay, the River Severn and Bristol, the Thames Estuary and the Kentish Coast, the Mondor and Magdalena Rivers in Colombia, the Lagos Lagoon, um, and, and beyond. Um, Jakarta, I should have said. Now these collaborations, such as this one, take cues from what is now called the Blue Humanities. And in thinking on and with water, we are also interested in addressing what anthropologist Anne Laura Stoller calls imperial duress. The hardened relations of imperial legacies, including port infrastructures, are themselves under duress as land subsists and seas surge. Now within this capacious frame, we are asking, what are the grounds of comparison? How might we conceptualize modes and methods of comparison with, in, for, rising waters? How do we think of a comparative framework that does not depend on fixed ground? Across diverse and differently vulnerable communities, how might we make space for social justice and non-human natures in and along rising waters? Now I'm gonna to come to the third and last project that I'm gonna to talk to you about. And this is the Data Refuge Project, which is now also uh, has spun off a second storytelling project called Data Remediations. And this idea of refuge or radical welcome is in fact key to what I wanna talk about. Data Refuge, my students have said, was born in the waters of the Schuylkill River. Um, and the project, um, here you see us getting ready for what was a data rescue. Data Refuge began uh, in November of 2016 in the immediate aftermath of federal elections um, in which we saw a climate denying administration uh, uh, and incoming administration getting ready. Um, and students began to worry and wonder about how federal climate and environmental data might be vulnerable um, to not being made accessible any longer, and thus began a crowdsourced um, uh, uh, collaborative public archiving project that was carried by 51 uh, libraries and universities across the country with some 7,000 volunteers. Now my students, as I mentioned, they said this project was born in the waters of the Schuylkill Core. The Schuylkill Core can be the Schuylkill River, excuse me, can be thought of in some ways as a forgotten place. Basic pollutant low data is not known for the tidal stretch of the river. It is a place we have in many ways turned our back on. Um, this was a project data refuge uh, that was um, done in collaboration with many other organizations, um, but most importantly for our purposes, the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, 
the Union of Concerned Scientists, in fact, helped us to um, gain traction with um, major news outlets. And in the weeks and months around the Trump uh, inauguration, the project did receive major media attention, and it was key to the public engagement that we aimed to cultivate. The story first appeared on December 14th in the Washington Post and then was picked up in major newspapers across the world in more than a dozen languages. It was reported on the CBS Evening News. It featured on a longer story on the PBS NewsHour and actually on a skit in The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Um, it's not every day that I appear on The Daily Show and it was a, a little bit surreal to say the least. And as we stated many times in the interviews about these projects, we strongly felt that there should be no need for a data refuge. What a waste of time, I shouted at a CNN crew. And the name itself, Data Refuge, was really intended to invite a certain puzzlement. Why would something as innocuous, and maybe even boring, as data need a refuge? Usually data live in a bank, a data bank, or a data repository, or a data warehouse. But why a data <coughs> refuge? A refuge, of course, is something, this is the de de dictionary definition, something to which one has recourse in difficulty. Now you double back to a refuge when the place you were headed is dangerous. But what would that mean in the case of data? Data aren't travelers, they're not migrants or refugees. They are givens, literally from that Latin, datum, right? That's from the verb to give, it's given. So can't we take them for granted? Do they need shelter from the storm or refuge? So together with students and with librarians, and here you see um, our then Vice Provost for Libraries, um, Carton Rogers on, on the right, and Associate University Librarian Kim Eke on the left, we, get, we began this public research project to examine how existing federal climate and environmental data might be vulnerable. We were sure that future data streams would dry up due to funding cuts, but we wanted also to know what about existing data. We wanted to know what archives preserved federal digital assets, these digital and data assets so crucial to climate models across the world. Where and how were they stored? What were their accession and retention schedules? We knew that threatened cuts would, would, future, would uh, threaten their future, but what about this past data? We consulted many, many times, and we began these data rescue op uh, operations. With the help of the Union of Concerned Scientists, we invited researchers to nominate federal data assets and inventories they wanted archived, and we then passed the nominations on to the volunteer archivists, coders, and tool builders at those 51 data rescue events. We developed a careful protocol for the events in order to establish and maintain a chain of custody for materials, then moved onto the online repository, www.datarefuge.org, um, and, um, and it, 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 it continues to be stewarded by the Penn Libraries. Now these events, you sort of get this feeling here when a vice provost rolls up his sleeves to fold programs like all hands are on deck. These events were really like bucket brigades, um, and they required really everyone to roll up their sleeves. They were all volunteer. They carried on for about six months into the summer of 2017, and they felt fiercely urgent. But like bucket brigades, they could only be carried on over a short period of time before, of course, your muscles get really exhausted. So in May of 2017, in partnership with the Association of Research Libraries and the Mozilla Foundation, we co-hosted a meeting at New America, a DC-based think tank, to try to dream up together what were more sustainable versions of data refuge. This was attended by university librarians and federal chief data officers, by foundation officers and more journalists, and the meeting asked us together to reimagine what a federal depository library program would look like in the digital age. In May of 2017, I also received, as the PI of a collaborative group, a grant from the National Geographic Foundation to extend the fledgling data storytelling events that some of these local data rescue events had featured. 
Transcending the growing community across these many events were, were stories about people who shared concerns, who recognized that we couldn't, in fact, take data as a matter of fact if we wanted that data to matter. Data and the infrastructures necessary to create, to support, and to serve up data rely, in the end, on labor hours and on people. They need to come to matter. Others must care about them if they're going to do their work. So as a storytelling collective, we set ourselves the imaginative challenge of thinking about data itself as a living thing, both constituted by as well as constitutive of what it describes. This ongoing work, we're working on it now, aims to develop tools to gen generate conversations with diverse research communities and civic audiences to promote environmental and data literacy, to talk about data poverty and data dreams, and about the wider ecology in which techno-scientific environmental sensing exists, or, like in the titles, Google doesn't. We've tested storytelling prompts at academic meetings, ranging from the annual meeting of the American Geophysical Union to, just two weeks ago, the College Art Association, um, and in a variety of other settings on our campus, at other libraries and other public venues in Philadelphia, including, oh sorry, this was the, a map of the 51 uh, data rescue events uh, that happened across the country. Um, this was the, the a meeting held to imagine a new library coalition, public-private partnership. Um, here you see us uh, talking to uh, researchers at the American Geophysical Union, asking them what, uh, how they cared about their data and where their data lived. Um, these are uh, artists and researchers who we talked to at the College Art Association. And here you see the, uh, some public storytelling tools we developed at the Philadelphia Science Festival about um, 10 months ago. Um, we asked Philadelphia residents to identify by their zip code which types of data they wish they had more of. This was a sort of data dreams. Um, and we asked uh, anyone who wanted to, but particularly kids, to think about the various ways that we describe places. We can describe them in pictures and images, we can describe them in words, and to promote sort of data literacy, we asked um, students, young kids, to think about how they might measure in quantitative terms those favorite places that they had. Um, we then, with their um, really quite stunning drawings, um, made an art science gallery of their favorite uh, places. You can tune in to the ongoing podcast series called Data Remediations, um, and we have hosted uh, a number of other events, including uh, around these data storytelling prompts and data art prompts, including with the, this year's Mellon PPEH artist in residence, Temple faculty member Roderick Coover. Rod's work will feature in two uh, public events, the May gathering that I already talked about, but then in November of this year, we will host um, an environmental storytelling uh, in virtual reality project, and Rod's uh, VR work will feature there. Together um, across these various events and now in partnership with six universities across the country, we're aiming to build this data story bank, um, which will culminate um, in a festival, data storytelling festival in, in Philadelphia in 2020. So just a word of conclusion. So data refuge is sadly no longer an oxymoron its need is all too legi legible amidst what anthropologist Anat Singh calls the ruined landscapes of the Anthropocene which are proliferating ever more wildly in the current time of apparently unfettered deregulation. We Anthropos are changing our planet, producing all manner of novel ecosystems. Perhaps they are ruins, perhaps they aren't, but in any case these ecosystems are failing to support the diversity of life known in the bygone era of climate stability, what I have increasingly come to think of as the happy Holocene. 
It is hard to know precisely what future knowledge communities we will need to represent and respond to the ongoing mass extinction event or the carbon legacies already baked into the Earth system, systems and bearing down on diverse and diversely vulnerable local places. We will need creativity. We need to collaborate locally and across networks, across institutions. We need, in the, word, in the words of those resident artists, the Environmental Performance Agency, we need to be like weeds, and we need to do so in public, with as many public participation, participants as we can manage. Together, we can cultivate the right to research. We can grow living archives full of love letters to the future, and we can create refuges that offer radical welcome, and not just for data. Thank you. So we've got about uh, half an hour for questions, for discussion. Um, Great. So if, if there are people that have things that they'd like to ask about or, or share, um, I'm sure Dr. Wiggin would be more than happy to, to continue the conversation with us. OK, thank you, Bethany. I'm, the thing I keep thinking about is how much of your, uh, how many of these projects are future oriented, like how you are trying to preserve and maintain things for the future. And I really love that because so much of the environmental humanities work that, that I know about is, is, is always kind of backward looking, trying to understand, trying to uh, find new ways of perceiving the past. So I wonder if you would uh, speak to like, what, uh, you know, whether you feel like that fosters an additional hmm. uh, access to hope for you, like when you are doing this kind of work, and if it helps you maintain it in light of, you know, the distress and the despair of, of so many of the things that you are facing when you're doing the work. Yeah, thank you, Ted. That was such a great question. Um, and I am actually, you know, a cultural historian by training, and so I do tend to think historically a lot. Um, I think in some ways my sense that the past has everything to do with the future um, can be kind of summed up in, in one anecdote. Um, I, um, I, I work a lot on colonial history, and one of the um, sort of unusual legacies of, of our area is uh, that in the archives there's a ton of German language materials that uh, as a, somebody who works in German history and transatlantic history I'm extremely interested in. And I also happen to live in the Germantown area of Philadelphia, which is just a co coincidence. But one day about, I don't know, eight years ago, I was asked to come and talk about my work uh, on these German archives to the Germantown um, Community Development Corporation. And these are really, you know, diverse business people and educators and people who started an amazing Germantown soccer program, like a real array of, of stakeholders in the community. And I started talking about like, well, do you know where the meeting where we're sitting right now, this is the meeting house of where the very first anti-slavery protest, written anti-slavery protest in the world was ever written, right here, 1688 Germantown. And right across the street, there were the, the, uh, an important stop on the Underground Railroad. Do you know the leaders in anti-slavery uh, causes that came out of this neighborhood. And I literally saw these people around the table like sit up a little taller and they were like, I didn't know that. And I saw how it made people feel different about where they lived. Knowing about their past literally was changing how they felt about their present, how they understood their place, and also about their agency to shape their future. And that lesson stayed with me in such a powerful way. Um, I think that in this country, you know, like we don't think a lot, we're constantly reinventing ourselves, we're Americans, we're like new, you know, the past isn't our problem. But actually, we're an old enough country now that we are dealing with hundreds year long, you know, long legacies that continue to really shape how we live and experience our present. I think we do better to understand them 
to really explore them and to understand them in all of their difficult complexities in order to be able to really promote and think about a more equitable and beautiful future. So yes, hope for sure. That was a great thing, Bethany. We talked about this a little bit at lunch, but um, what's your pitch on the environmental humanities to the STEM obsessive community out there? What do you tell them to get them excited about this approach to understanding? Oh yeah. Um, well, I you know I I don't want to sound flippant, right? But like, do you care about NSF funding? Like just yesterday, and a bill was introduced to slash the NSF funding entirely, right? That is not a joke. If you care about engineering at all, if you care about infrastructure in this country, then you need to care about why it matters and be able to communicate why it matters at the very least. Environment, and I get like super worked up about this, so I'm getting like all preachy. Sorry. <laughs> I hate that. But um, I mean, I just think um, I've spent a lot of time collaborating with engineers and with um, scientists. And I really think that, so I say this a lot to my, uh, my one of my very favorite colleagues at Penn is our, our Dean for Natural Sciences. Um, Larry Gladney and Larry and I sometimes stage a debate in front of our students together in which Larry says um, environmental humanities is just science communication and I say call it what you like like it is science communication of course as a humanist I think that humanities also bring something more there's a reason why stem and steam are different the humanities don't just sort of instrumentally communicate science. There's a different way of knowing, and when that's thought together in collaborative research communities, you end up asking very different types of questions together. So we think a lot about um, what I mentioned uh, already uh, about distant disciplinary uh, disciplinarity, which is um, not to say let's get together and make uh, you know some interdisciplinary thing, but let's use our expertise in engineering and let's use our expertise as historians to come together in this third space. Not that we're going to be sort of bad engineers and bad historians, but that we're going to be great at those things, but collaborate in this other way. Hi, um, so my name is Erica Blatt. I'm a professor over in the College of Education, actually in the Department of STEAM Education. Oh, great. Um, and my field is environmental education, and I'm currently working with Jordan and some others in environmental science, um, the new School of Earth and Environment, to create a certificate program in environmental education. Um, for those of you that might be interested, <laughs> little plug there coming hopefully in the future here. Um, but my question to you is, so I see a ton of overlap, obviously, in what you're doing and education. Um, and I was just wondering, um, like, in what, I, I saw a lot of examples of kind of like informal ways yeah. that you're incorporating educational aspects into what you're doing, um, and in informal sites, right? Um, yeah. Also, I, I live in West Philly, too, <laughs> and I went oh, to great. NGSE, so we should, we should talk later. But anyway, um, so I'm just wondering, yeah, if you could talk a little bit about kind of how you view the different ways, I guess different pieces of your work in terms of education, the educational aspect. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Erica, for that question. I think it's really important. Um, I um, actually just last week gave a talk about um, the different types of pedagogies that environmental humanities both sort of affords, but maybe also demands. Um, and I touched on that a little bit here in terms of experiential or embodied learning. Um, and I, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a trained, you know, like educational professor like you are. So I, I don't want to get too far out over my skis. Um, but I, I think that um, the, the great, the, the successes that we have had in more formal educational settings um, really have to do with empowering students to do research on, to think of themselves as researchers. And um, by, by taking them serious, by helping them understand what it means to pose a research question, um, but to do it in a way that they um, might not, um, 
they may come into the classroom, uh, and I think you know, I certainly did as an undergraduate, was that research was something that you did from kind of 5,000 feet above your research field, right? You were an expert and you read a whole lot of things and that had very maybe little to do with something like a lived experience. So the difference that we're really trying to make with our student researchers and with our own, you know, with all researchers, is to really try to understand what it means to be a participant observer who is also a researcher. So what does, what does it mean to be part of the community that you are researching with? Not researching in or for, but actually with. And what we are trying to really now articulate more consciously is what that researching with, how it changes our research questions themselves, right? Um, th these are things that are like really quite, you know, common best accepted practices in, in the fields of design and, and, and architecture, um, not always maybe, but, um, you know, not always used as robustly as they might be. Um, but when you do community-based research, like what does that look like in a history classroom? What does that look like um, in a literature class? You know, these are the types of things about that we're really thinking through as we're building an environmental humanities curriculum. Um, my name is Mark Lobauer. I'm a new adjunct professor here teaching environmental advocacy. You touched on something that I think is of critical importance if we're to do anything you know, to save ourselves from climate disruption. And that was the cross-cultural aspect of the Rising Waters program you talked about. I think we as an American society need to understand the damage that we are wreaking upon. Mm. The, the less wealthy uh, nations of the world and understand how those cultures are reacting to it. And I wonder if uh, you can speak to that a little more. Yeah, oh, thank you um, for that observation and question. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, global warming, as it says, is a global problem, right? Or it's a global phenomenon. For some, it's an opportunity, right? And I mean by that, that global warming will be experienced very differently in local places. So it has both a global and a local articulation. And even within locales, let's just take, you know, Philadelphia, right? That global warming will be experienced very differently by different people, by different neighborhoods. And it's really, I think, paying attention to the, the both global or planetary dimensions of what's happening, as well as how it affects different communities quite differently. That is at the heart of the challenge that global warming presents. How you build empathy across, let's say, haves and have nots, or the climate wealthy and the climate impoverished, you know, that's uh, anybody's best guess. Um, we, certainly there's a fair amount of research about how to spark empathy and effective climate communication um, and, and you know a couple of pieces that I, I would say um, and these are not mine like these are like really talented climate communicator I think is uh, scientist Catherine Hayhoe who has a, a really incredible TED talk that I would really urge you to watch um, and I have learned tremendously from her work, which is, um, you know, really to, to, to just um, also, you know, not be defeatist. Um, the difference between 1.5 degrees of warming and 2 degrees warming is huge. Like there's, and the difference between 2.5 degrees and 2 is huge, right? So you don't just be like, well, climate change, it's done. Like, that's crazy. It's not like an on-off switch. It's not like a yes or no. It's an actually massively complex problem. And so doing something is always going to be better than doing nothing. And so I think saying, sort of being able to tell sort of more complex stories that, that just say, like, it's not climate change, bad, good, climate change, yes, no. Like, in this country, we weirdly for years now two decades have been hung up on is it real or not which is like complete BS we're the, like one of the f three countries in the world where this is even still some I don't think it is recent polls show that it's like 70% of the American public is now firmly like on board which is great 
But like two decades, a little late, people. Like, you know, come on, we wasted a lot of time. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't act on climate just because we're behind. It means we should absolutely, with resolution, act on climate. Um, and I do firmly believe that civic education and public education are at the heart of how we will meaningfully find empathy, understand the complexity of the problem, and act. You noted, I, I, I think the profile said you started this program in 2014, so it's still relatively new for yeah. you. It's a new thing that we're, we're doing here as well. So on the theme of uh, future-oriented, like in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, if you had sort of your ideal understanding of what um, environmental humanities looks like at Penn and in these collaborations, like where are you trying to take this and, and how, how could an institution like ours uh, be part of that? Yeah. Uh, I love these, these forward-looking questions, and I love the collaborative gesture of that uh, question, too. And um, I, I love thinking with groups like, like you about this very question. Um, I was really super, um, um, <laughs> time's up. I was uh, super um, honored uh, last week. The um, Penn hosted the, the um, annual meeting of the Ivies Plus deans, um, and they asked me to talk about exactly this question. And so I'll, I'll just repeat myself, um, because I don't have that don't many, many original yes. thoughts, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and what I said was that I actually think, um, so I talked a little bit in my talk about this sense of urgency, I think, that so many of us are feeling and this idea that we really need to, to move quickly. And while I think that's true, I actually think that um, a consensus-driven model about what environmental humanities is in different places is really the best way forward. Um, and that means like you invited me to say like, what do I, Bethany Wigan, think environmental humanities should look like? And I hate to sound like such a cop out, but I would actually say it's a, it's a, it's a really a question that can only be answered collaboratively. Like I'm a historian. I don't know what the natural scientists think environmental humanities should look like. I spend a lot of time explaining to scientists and engineers why I think what I think is really powerful about the environmental humanities, but then I need to hear back from them what they think is powerful in that space. And that is going to change and shape, you know, what we do. Um, I made a proposal recently in a faculty meeting um, that uh, I don't know, you know, I think there's some uh, interest in, which is that, um, you know, many programs uh, in sustainability, including the one at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, actually originated in um, the facilities and real estate side of the campus. That our campus's really wonderful sustainability office came out of um, thinking about how we could green our campus. And we've done a great job. Um, and now the thinking is like, Penn you know, is also very proud to be the first Ivy who signed a climate action plan. We're now developing the third iteration of that climate action plan, and it is increasingly clear that climate education will be STEAM education, right? So that means that we can't have our sustainability initiatives not centrally part of our academic work. Now, as I talked about with the Ivy's deans, some people think, okay, well, that means that we should have uh, an environmental or sustainability um, set of requirements in our general education curriculum. Um, I uh, am the maybe sort of rare like bird anarchist who think like I don't know I don't learn well with requirements like <laughs> general education requirements are, are great but I think that there is a, a, um, a danger in requirements because nobody wants to take them right and then it becomes the thing that you're forcing people that forcing it at them and I think like what I really firmly believe is that we have to be so awesome and cool in the courses that we offer and the public programs that we do and the opportunities we make available for student researchers that, that it's just a no-brainer, that you can't not be there because it's that cool. Um, so I'm really thinking more about culture shift, I think. Um, I think there is real room for requirements as well. The proposal that I had said is that I think this is so serious there should actually be a vice provost for climate change, right? Like that should be a vice provostal kind of level 
This is a huge issue. Um, Penn and, and you know, Rowan, um, huge endowments, huge amounts of resources to put at this problem. I think you know, we owe it. Uh, we made our money. You know, like not always in the most savory ways. So we really need to think about like what what is our responsibility as wealthy institutions to to, to move forward. So I, I have a question, sort of following up. I, I think what, what what Dustin was was asking about. And I wonder if you can say a little bit more about the process of collaboration um, in, in your center, because clearly you know you're collaborating on any number of different levels, and I was struck by your response to an earlier question about that third space between mm. you know, the humanities, engineers, and how we kind of meet. And can you um, kind of reflect a little bit more on what you found successful in crafting you know, mm. collaborations you know, within Philadelphia, places like Mumbai, that sort of global, local thing? So it strikes me that that's such an important component, but it's also like immensely hard work. Yeah. And um, uh, you know, so some guidance or, or, or some yeah. recommendations for what, uh, yeah. what you found to be successful. Oh, that's such a great question, and thanks um, for for asking it. I think um, you're a hundred percent right that collaboration is really hard. Um, it's not often recognized as such. So thanks for that as well. I mean, it's one of those. You know, collaboration is a, it's a lovely word, but it's. It's really yeah, what is it though, right? Um, and actually, so um, it's a skill that I now teach as part of research methodologies that I offer for graduate fellows at Penn um, to really say, like, what does it mean to collaborate, first of all, across disciplines, but then uh, also often with community or public partners. Um, and the first thing that I say to them, I think in some ways is maybe kind of um, true of how I think about collaboration and how I try to teach it and model it um, kind of more generally, which is that I say, like, to collaborate with someone does not mean to write them an email and think they got it. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> we all get way too many emails. Just because you think you communicated something does not mean that it was received, heard, or understood, even if the email's read. Like, what really to collaborate it, it's so you know trite but it is so true is to listen like you have to show up for people you have to be in the same shared space with them if you are collaborating with a public partner you i think it's on you to go to them do not ask them to make time to come to campus like forget it they're way busier and way less resourced than you absolutely um, and that's another reason why, for all of our sense of urgency, this willingness to slow down and to listen to people, to go to community meetings, to show up, um, to take an interest in the lives of your collaborators beyond how you understand even the frame of your collaboration, it goes miles. And then it shows up in the quality of the work that you are able to make together in ways that you never can predict. So you might think like, why am I going to this meet? Like I think that almost happened, why am I going? And then you know you hear these oral histories that you're able to collect because people trust you and you have a sense of shared purpose. Um, so I would say slowing down, listening, um, and getting out of your own way a little bit. Um, so you talked a little bit about, well, a lot about, um, a bunch of upcoming events, um, particularly in the Philadelphia area. And so I was thinking, um, sort of extend that, um, I teach in the Communication Studies Department. We have a bunch of our students here today. And so we are always sort of talking about looking ahead, looking ahead, right jobs, internships, ways to get involved. So, I mean, is there any, um, especially like locally, any ways that you might um, suggest or point some of our students to get involved? Oh yeah, what a great question. I Well, the most um, immediate thing I, I already mentioned is this May um, 9th, 10th, 11th meeting. The website will actually um, launch tomorrow. Um, that we, we are putting this event, it's a fairly um, ambitious event and we're putting it together in a very short time horizon. So bear with us <laughs> as we get like everything finalized. Um, but the, um, 
there are film screenings involved, um, and there are um, public um, sort of art making events that are involved. In terms of more formal, like so, it kind of like open conference festival around rising waters with various researchers and I really do hope that you will come. Um, there are, um, there are uh, this summer, uh, last summer we had four internships for, for community fellows. This summer we aren't doing that because of capacity. Next summer we will do it again. Um, so there are, we are constantly trying to make room for um, non-pen people in our programs. Um, this year, um, we are, of course, making those Ecotopian toolmaking grants available. So um, the application deadline, uh, I was just saying, I can bring it up actually here, I think. Um, uh, let's see if we can. So here you can learn uh, more about uh, the project, um, and you can see uh, five toolmakers will be awarded this year uh, for grants. We also love team proposals for 1,500. If you need, uh, you know, ideas, um, you can look through um, the catalog uh, of last year's tools. Um, fully described here. Um, some were team, some were individuals, um, all kinds of different uh, tool making things. Um, we, we are very interested in um, projects that we think really touch uh, communities, of course, that is hard for us to, to get to. And you, you would all be great. We, we don't work on this side of the Delaware <laughs> yet. So <laughs> it'd be great to, to have some applications roll in. Thank you. Unless there are any other questions, or I'm sure you can talk to Dr. Woody afterwards. But thank you so much. Thank for you. This talk yeah, thanks. Thank you all. Thanks.